really like to be inside your head to see how you see it and what you make of it. And, and I, I'm wondering if there can be a link for you if, if some of you were in Romeo and Juliet uh, about to be, I don't know if there are any people here who, hands up, anybody who's in Romeo? Yes, lovely, few people. Um, and probably you'll go, go to watch. And uh, um, I was in the original Romeo and Juliet when Kenneth first, first choreographed in 1965, which was not that long. You know, it's only 20 years on from something like Gorbals. And Kenneth himself, had been in, I think Kenneth's in that ballet, I'm sure I saw him at one point, and um, Kenneth had this way when he was setting the crowd scenes in Romeo and Juliet. Now I always remember him going up to a, a girl in the company one day and saying to her, you know, so what's your name? And she said, oh, um, Claire. No, no, he said, I mean in Italy. What's your name in Italy? We're in Italy. This is set in Verona. You have to have an Italian name. And this girl was completely flummoxed. And, uh, and he said, well, call yourself Maria. But you have to have a history. And that's a little bit of what Gillian Lynn was saying about having that narrative. So that I think it was Bobby who really established that feeling for dancers when they were in his ballets. But of course, also Ninette de Valois did it. She made uh, ballets which, when Anna was saying that she created the Rake's Progress, and Robert Hopman was the lead, the Rake. And if ever any of you have a chance to go to the museum just close to Hoban Station, the Sir John Soane Museum, there's a, a whole raft of paintings by William Hogarth about the Rake's Progress. And de Valois took those paintings and made a ballet. And of course, they are, they are paintings about London scenes. And a lot of them are about the poverty and the wretchedness of people's lives. And so when we were in those ballets, and I was in the Rake's Progress, when I just joined the Royal Ballet, and, and of course, she didn't accept that you couldn't immediately get it. She wanted you immediately to be in the right, the, the right person, in the right period, completely able to understand the steps that she'd set, which were very exact. But it was to get into the heart of all of these characters. And I think that's the thing that um, I know when I first joined the company and Bobby was around, and one of the, th the amazing things about him was that he, he was Bobby. Now, he was Sir Robert Helpman, um, but he was actually known as Bobby to everybody. And he also had this wonderful way of moving through the company in a rehearsal and talking to people. And in those days, when I first joined the Royal Ballet, talking about the late 50s, the hierarchy within the company was such that if you were in the corps de ballet, you didn't really speak to a soloist. And if you were a soloist, you didn't really have much to do with the principal dancers. And people were very much in their ranks. But Bobby was just the most approachable, wonderful person. And I had first heard about him growing up in South Africa. Somebody had given me a wonderful book about the Sadler's Wells Ballet. And I used to sit and dream and turn these pages. And there was Margot Fontaine and Michael Soames and Moira Shearer and Robert Heldman. And when I joined the company, of course, I couldn't believe that all these people came out of this book. You know, and it's hard for you to imagine. I'd never seen a professional ballet company when I came to England. I'd never seen a ballet film. There were no such things as videos. This was before mobile phones and all that sort of thing. So you only really got your information from people or from books. And so to be able to be in the same room as Robert Helpman and find yourself trying to be brave enough to actually say, Bobby, um, 
And I was, um, I was given the role of the Black Queen in Devalva's Checkmate. And Bobby was the Red King. And the Black Queen and the Red King are on opposite sides. And she intends to kill him. And there's the, this wonderful variation that Deval was set for the Black Queen. And you're the audience, and the Black Queen comes on downstage, stage left. And the stage cloth is these wonderful squares, just like a chessboard. And she dances across, and then she moves up a set of squares and comes back, and moves up a set of squares. And, and seated at the back, on his throne is the Red King watching her. And the Black Queen, most of the time, has her back to the audience. And the Red King is sitting on his throne, not doing anything, but just watching her. And she's like a cat. Devalwa used to say she was like a cat prowling, approaching her prey, little by little, getting closer and closer. Now, I always had this, this impression in my mind that there there was the Black Queen, there was me, dancing my socks off. It was a killing variation. And that nobody in the audience was watching me at all. They were all watching Bobby, sitting on the throne there, just watching the, bla the Black Queen coming closer and closer. And, and yet, of course, he, he really wasn't trying to upstage us. Mm. He was doing his role, but he really, really conveyed that it was completely real. He wasn't playing a part. He was completely living it. And so when you watched him, and he had these amazing, huge eyes, you, you'd fix on his eyes, and it was like you were mesmerized. You couldn't take your eyes off his eyes. So when he then, um, a few years after that, about five years later, mm -hmm. he created a ballet called Electra. And um, yeah, this was 1963. This was 63, and I joined in 58. So mm -hmm. I'd seen him playing one of the ugly sisters in Cinderella, which hasn't been in the rep of the Royal Ballet for a while now. So lots of you probably don't know uh, Frederick Ashton's Cinderella, but the part of the two ugly sisters at that time, one ugly sister was Frederick Ashton, and the other ugly sister was Robert Helpman. And they were extraordinary. They were very, very naughty. They scored off each other the whole time. So Frederick Ashton played the sister as if he was this frightened little mouse and uh, sort of quivering at the ugly, other ugly sister. And Robert Helpman was this dominant, horrible ugly sister who would, could really have killed anybody. <laughs> and these two, but by, by but Frederick Ashton, both of them being so skilled artistically that they played their roles and I think Margot Fontaine was Cinderella and I don't suppose people watched Margot Fontaine very much. They were so busy watching these two <laughs> ugly sisters who were simply extraordinary. I think Margot Fontaine actually said at one time that she learnt how to perform because being on a stage with Helpman, yes. if she hadn't learnt how to project, yes. nobody, she yes. wouldn't get a look in. And she actually writes about that in her biography. So, yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think he also, he, he, he was a very, very generous person and he, uh, he was just mad about the theatre. You know, and the idea that he would have performed Albrecht one night here at the Opera House and then gone down to the Old Vic on the other side of the river and performed Hamlet. You know, I, I mean, it's, it's quite a thought. Uh, and he, he was performing um, Hamlet in repertoire with a very great Shakespearean actor called Paul Schofield. So it's not as if he was a kind of also ran ballet dancer who occasionally acted. He was an incredibly well respected yes. actor. And actually, he beat Laurence Olivier to the role of Oberon, Oberon in that production I was telling you about. It's quite extraordinary. Um, so Did you've spoken about seeing him as a fellow dancer mm. perform. Mm and in the audience. Apart, apart from the Ugly Sisters, what do you remember from the auditorium watching him perform? Well, you know, Anna, I don't think I ever did watch him from the auditorium because I was always on stage. <laughs> I mean, he did, um, 
he did he did Carabos in Sleeping Beauty. He was absolutely astonishing. I mean, he was just extraordinary. You couldn't take your eyes off him. But then, when he choreographed Electra, he was um, he was just heaven to work with because uh, apparently he he he, he used um, improvisatory methods. Tried to get work from the dancers. Well, don't most choreographers? What, was it that quite most a radical choreographers, at the time? Well, it was complete contrast to Devalva, who right. knew exactly what every little finger was going to be doing on every person. Ashton was, he allowed the dancers to input, and, and Bobby really did as well. And so working with him was, you felt very grown up. You know, you didn't feel you were being dictated to the whole time. You didn't feel you were being super controlled. And the role that I played was Clytemnestra. And Clytemnestra, it's, it's a Greek tragedy. Electra is Clytemnestra's daughter. And um, uh, Clytemnestra has killed her husband and taken a lover. And, and then her son returns to find that his mother has killed his father and has taken a lover. So it's rather intense. The sets were designed by an Australian and they were really very provocative. And I remember walking on stage on the very first day and looking at the wings and the paintings of these people. And uh, some of it was really rather naughty. And Bobby said, have you noticed the wing up there? I said, yes, I don't know if I dare look. <laughs> and he said, yes, he's been very naughty. We won't, we won't concentrate on that. And I hope Madam doesn't notice it. <laughs> anyway, um, he, I think one of my lessons from him was that he made Clytemnestra um, behave sort of like a snake so that she slithered her way across the stage. And, there was one entrance where I had to come on from the wings, dragging behind me, throttling me, an enormous cloak. And I came on trying to not look too much like a, one of those salamanders, but a snake, slithering on. And when you got to center stage, you had to stand up and then let the air get under the cloak so that it spread in the most perfect semicircle. And then you had to slither up a flight of stairs. Well, I can't tell you how many times I tried to get this cloak to behave. And, and Bobby was always saying to me, just let the air get underneath it. Monica, don't try too hard, just let the air. And of course, then he would do it. Perfect. I think I eventually probably got it, but it, it was not totally reliable. <laughs> and I so wanted it to be right. He was, um, he was just brilliant. And later, very, very many years later, I remember we were performing at the um, Met Opera House in in New York, and uh, I looked out into the stalls and saw he was sitting there. And this was when he was by now back in Australia. I think this might have been the last time you saw him. The uh, last time I yeah. saw him, and he was sitting in the stalls. And I went out front and went, sat next to him and said, oh, I can't believe you're here. It's so wonderful to see you, and how are you? And he said, well, I'm over here from Australia. He said, I just wanted to come and see the company on their opening week here in New York. and. And I, I said to him, you know, now I so uh, admire and revere you and everything you've done. And you've produced musicals, you've directed plays, you've choreographed, you've run the Australian Ballet. How have you done all of this, Bobby? And he said, I never learned how to say no. And so he said, I've fallen on my face a lot. I've made awful mistakes, but I never stopped learning. And I think we hugged each other and I went back up onto the rehearsal and I never saw him again. And, uh, but he had a huge impact on me because he was so friendly and was such a man of the theatre. And it wasn't about anything to do with how you performed your steps. It was what everything meant and how you were going to get that message out across the orchestra pit in, into the audience. My, my understanding is that he had an enormous um, impact on the way that we perform the absolutely classical roles, the 19th century yes, ballets, yes. the role of Albrecht, the role of Siegfried. Yes. We take it for granted now, if you, if you think about Liam Scarlett's recent Swan Lake, yes, yes. which has got a sort of dramatic logic to it for yes. our times. Mm -hmm. 
that whole approach, uh, my understanding was of, of making it real, even for such a, a venerable old work, really stemmed from the way that Helpman approached the role. Well, I think his influence went right through, and I think, as I said before, Kenneth Macmillan clearly uh, watched him and learned from him. And, and that was why when Anthony Dow did his production of Swan Lake, you know, Anthony didn't want the prince not to look like a, a real human being. He didn't want suddenly for someone to behave what we romantically think of as behaving like a prince. He wanted him to be a prince so that he could just walk on as a human being. But you just knew by the way that other people responded to him and reacted to him and bowed to him that he was the central figure. And of course, Bobby, with the charisma that he had, you know, commanded one's attention and held the stage like that. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's come through, and it's still in the Royal Ballet now. You know, you can't be a ballet dancer when you're in the town square scenes of Romeo and Juliet. And, and, and Liam, you know, having seen what Liam did with Cunning Little Vixen, yes. you know, he made, he wanted people to be the creatures that they were. You weren't just... It wasn't a superficial thing, and it wasn't anything to do with the costume you were wearing. Every mannerism, every little gesture was true to the, the creature you were. Yes, in, in, during the war, help, when Ashton was busy having to be in the RAF, Helpman didn't have to because he was an Australian citizen. So while Ashton was away, he actually made quite a few choreographies at the yes, Royal. Yes. Um, and one of them was a ballet called The Birds, which f from the photographs, it looks wonderful. The dancers very much became the birds, yes. bird yes. gestures. Yes. But just just before we have to finish, um, another great ballet he made at that time was Hamlet. Yes. Um, and it's often said that uh, he made it as a sort of pitch because he wanted to perform in the Shakespeare yes. play yes. in the title role, which he eventually did. Yes. But the ballet became a real classic. It's it's a dreamlike. Uh, it's the moment of Hamlet's death, isn't it, where he's having a sort of dreamed recollection, and it's just an 18-minute score. And you were Gertrude yes, twice. I was, I was Hamlet's mother when I was, think I was 19, <laughs> and, and Hamlet was um, either Anthony Dahl or Rudolf Nureyev, and, of course, the two of them were very, very different. Bobby, um, again, <coughs> he... he he gave you the courage to believe that you could take on something like that. You know, I mean, you've all experienced that, that wonderful moment when somebody says something to you and you just think, yes, yeah, yeah, I get it, now I get it. And Bobby was like that the whole time. And he, he, he never raised his voice, he never shouted, he never put people down. He would just persuade you more and more and more to have another go, have another go. And so to play Gertrude was just absolutely wonderful. Um, I remember somebody saying, um, an, an, an actor coming to the performance yeah. and saying afterwards at the stage door, trust him, we're on stage with Hamlet for three and a half hours and he does it all in 18 minutes. <laughs> and he did. He so understood the play that he just got to the heart of it and in that, it's a wonderful Tchaikovsky overture. The music's fabulous. It's very dramatic. And for those of you who were at White Lodge, I don't know, you know where the um, studio theatre is, and then you go up the stairs, and there's a huge mural. That's the backcloth for Hamlet, the Leslie Hurry. And, and I was absolutely thrilled, because quite by chance, I met somebody out front in the Opera House one night, who said to me, Monica, I've got a copy of the Leslie Hurry backcloth. Would do you think you'd like it? And of course, I then collected it from their house in South London somewhere, and came on the back. It was on the back of a lorry, actually. We pulled it off the back of a lorry and brought it here to the opera house, and then framed it and hung it at White Lodge. And that's and again, you can see in that the kind of dramatic background that there was because it's a fabulous design the costumes were absolutely wonderful and and uh, but uh, this is wonderful to have an evening like this for you because he's a very very important person and every single time 
you cross the road and go to the to the Devalwa studio. Do really look at those photographs of Bobby outside the Helpman studio, because there are the most fabulous photographs of Robert Helpman that were taken, I suppose, in the 40s and 50s. Really, really look at them, because not only are they period photographs, and, and at that time there was the great fashion of having the vision of the person and then an enormous shadow <laughs> by their side. It was really the, was just the thing at the time. But they're such wonderful photographs and that they do give you a little sense of how marvellous he must have been. And, and this idea of, of him being like a chameleon. Yes. He really does change in his roles. Um, the story goes, and Dame Monica will know this very well, um, but when he first turned up, um, hoping to get a job with de Valois company, the Sadler's Wells Theatre, Madame took one look at his face and said, oh yes, I can do something with that face. Um, because he had, as you said, these extraordinary yeah, eyes and this quite, quite delicate chin. But he was a great master of makeup. Um, and he would just completely change himself. But of course, makeup is not just what the slap that you stick on, it's the way that you then use your mm. whole body. And the role of the Red King that you were talking mm. about, Helpman, it was the last role he ever did before he died mm. in, in 1986. And he first did it nearly half a century earlier in 1937 when he was a young man. Mm. And yet he made himself into this very old man. Um, so I, I find it a terrible shame that he's not better known. Everybody knows about Fontaine, everybody knows about Nureyev, but he was her first great partner. And, yes. Um, yes, he was, and I think that, I, I even think that he, he affected David Bintley, because sure. David Bintley was the most astonishingly wonderful Red King mm. in, in Checkmate, and he got that by, because David has a tremendous sense of history, Yes. And I think he completely understood what de Valois ballets were about. Mm -hmm. And he could see the link between de Valois and Helpman. And uh, so they all played a really, really important part. So now you've had a little feel, so now you're all infected with it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.